We are now live for the Revolution 250 podcast. Welcome, everyone. I am Bob Allison. I chair the Revolution 250 advisory group and Revolution 250. We're a collection of about 70 organizations in Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the American Revolution. And our guest today is James Kirby Martin, who really is the indispensable historian. Uh, his career, for 30 years, he was a professor at the um, University of Houston, where he also was a vice president for academic affairs. In fact, he retired as the U. Roy and Lily Cramps Cullen University professor of history. But in addition to teaching at the University of Houston, he was the Mark Clark Distinguished Professor of History at the Citadel. And he also was the Charles Paul Ewing Visiting Professor of Military History at West Point. Distinguished military historian, uh, historian of the revolution, as well as an historian about alcohol in the early American Republic. So um, welcome, Jim Martin. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, the compliments. Uh, I, don't, I don't think of myself as so much indispensable these days as, well, you take the word emeritus and uh, mm -hmm. retired from academic teaching in 2018. And I would say that I've become an extinguished historian in a certain way, <laughs> as opposed to distinguished, if I could, if I could throw in a, well, whatever, that's a way to put it, I guess. But yes, thank you. It's great to be here, really. Well, it's great to have you. And I realized as I was talking about you that I could go on talking for the next half hour and not get you a chance to say anything. So that's why I stopped. But Okay. Um, well, sooner or later, I, I would have just cut in, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay. So, so thank you. I, actually, this is a we're one of the things we're going to talk about is a project that's been a long time in the making. About twenty some odd years ago, you wrote a terrific biography of Benedict Arnold, revolutionary hero, which introduces Arnold in a new way. It actually doesn't deal with the episode we all know, but really his career up to that point. Uh, and there, there it does mention what happens then in uh, 1780, but it really is framing Arnold in a new way. And now you've just been part of a movie project about Arnold. So why don't we just talk a bit about Benedict Arnold and why he still fascinates us? Well, I'd be happy to. Um, my first experience with Benedict Arnold um, goes back to my childhood. It took. Uh, a version of U.S. history in the fourth grade, and I remembered certain parts of it, and I fell in love with the early period and the revolution. And the, the teacher, and I think this is pretty standard uh, in my youth, uh, sort of the revolution was, here's George Washington on one side and all the good people, and here on the other side was Benedict Arnold and all the bad people. And Arnold was the bad guy because he, even though he originally committed treason, he committed treason a second time. And the teacher didn't really explain that to us, I might, I might add, mm -hmm. uh, but he had turned against his country and that made him a bad person. And in turn, as I, as I grew up and continued to study the, uh, history more generally in the topic, uh, it became clear to me, especially as uh, I was getting into my academic career, that there was an amazing story there that wasn't really being told in many ways. Uh, that is with respect to Arnold and part of that had to do with the habit of many biographies. Uh, the, by the way, the first Arnold biography came out in the 1830s. He was that important in the 1830s. Yeah, yeah. George Sparks went on, or maybe he was already a president of Harvard College, a uh, very uh, learned historian, uh, collected lots of papers with Washington, for instance, and and uh, he wrote this book. And uh, he, he really did some interesting stuff because he sort of did oral history, maybe in an era when you didn't think in terms yeah. of oral yeah. history. Uh, and he interviewed individuals who claimed to have known Arnold. And what they really, what they really said was, well, this bad guy in 1780 really began as a bad guy. And it was sort of like his career was a story all down, yeah. sort of looking backward through history. So we're, mm -hmm. we're looking backward through the act of treason uh, to that point in time. Uh, when Arnold was born, and he was sort of of the seed of Satan. And the, these old timers, as I call them, they sort of came up with some great stories, like Arnold when he was, I'm not going to tell them all, but, but I call them the seven deadly sins of Arnold. We don't want to go through all seven of them. But um, 
uh, like Arnold liked to do things like climb up in trees and break the necks of baby birds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that Arnold loved to step, stand up on tables during thunderstorms and shout and scream as if he was screaming uh, as if an agent of the devil. And, and this mm. kind of stuff uh, was out there and actually worked its way into biographies right down to our time. Mm -hmm. It was kind of an acceptance factor. We're going to study him backward through trees, and then we're going to hunt around and find those, if I could use this term, character flaws that he had. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can understand how this man could turn against the revolution. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's the traditional Arnold story. Yeah. Uh, and what I then said, well, I worked with one of the greats uh, when I was in graduate school in Wisconsin, with one of the greats of uh, revolutionary era history, a man by the name of Merrill Jensen. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jensen said over and over again, your study, your research begins in the archives. Go to the archives. I don't want to see anything you haven't shown that you can come up with stuff in the mm -hmm. archives. Now, while my dissertation had nothing to do with Arnold, per se, it is an important lesson. And I really tried to apply that to the Arnold situation. Mm -hmm. Let's go back. Let's see what happens when, instead of looking backward through treason, we really look forward mm -hmm. from the beginning of his life. Mm -hmm. and just to give you a couple of examples, most of the Arnold stories, as I've already suggested, are made up. Arnold only at one point talked about his childhood, which is interesting. I've only found one letter mm -hmm. out there, and, uh, uh, and this is something he made, a comment he made during the revolution, when someone will tell me about yourself kind of a, a comment. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, fundamentally, he was a coward until about the age of 16. Hmm. Here's this guy who was supposedly this nasty, nasty person. Yeah. It turns out, turns out he thought he was a coward. Well, what, hmm. what was about that? Well, what was about that was his family developed all sorts of problems. And again, to not go through this in great detail, uh, the family was hit by an epidemic uh, in 1750. Uh, and maybe it was even a little bit before that. And some of the children died. And, and I think this was a diphtheria epidemic. Yeah. Many books say it was another disease, but uh, based on what I've been able to tell, because it's the closing of the throat mm -hmm. and basically you know, choking to death or not yeah. even yeah. Choking, whatever. And <clears throat> it also hit the father. And it really ruined him in terms of his emotional stability. And he was a successful merchant at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he sort of lost his way and he got heavy into alcohol and he became sort of like, mm. or sort of, he became the town drunk and an embarrassment. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so so this is going to obviously affect Arnold because he's, he, he's the now the eldest son. Uh, mm. He is one of the two survivors. His other survivor is his sister, Hannah. And basically he had to become, he had to man up at that point, mm -hmm. 15, 16 years old. And he will go on to uh, become an apothecary, uh, studying with uh, uh, men who are related to his mother, the Lathrop brothers. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they will set him up as a merchant in New Haven, where he's very successful up to the time of the war. Well, let, let's back up. What's there? What Arnold saw was a community that sort of turned against him in many ways because his father was an embarrassment. Uh, his mother was a very religious woman, Calvinist. And she would write him letters when he was off to school and say, beware, you know, the Lord can strike you dead at any time. He's doing that in our family. He can do that to you back in, back in uh, uh, Norwich when I referred to the, uh, the family. He's off at school about that many miles away. Mm -hmm. And my, what you can derive from this is this has to do with arbitrary power. Right. And this, this is very important to understand because in a person's childhood, if they're constantly dealing with issues of arbitrary power, you can translate that very easily uh, into uh, the coming of the revolution. Because what is so much of it about? It's about we see the British as a source of arbitrary power. And Arnold really tapped into that and became this enthusiastic revolutionary in 1775. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the story that I wanted to emphasize while giving some hints at the end as to why I speculated and thought that uh, mm -hmm. what about the business of turning against the very cause that he so loved back in 1775. Mm. So yeah, that's a, that's a, I guess, fair summary of, of yeah. uh, the childhood. It's, it's brief. There's much more detail in the book, obviously. There is, there is. It's very well written too. It's and, and uh, anyway, uh, 
So Arnold will get involved right off the bat. Yeah. And this is a question. I'm going to do it this way. If Arnold had a character flaw, if we go back to the character flaw thesis, and we sort of mm -hmm. hunt and dig is what, what yeah, yeah. previous historians uh, were doing, uh, all the way back to Jared Sparks and then coming forward, then how does that character flaw explain uh, his taking of, and, and obviously with Ethan Allen, there are all sorts of problems there, the taking mm -hmm. by Conroga. How does that explain this unbelievable march to Quebec, moving an army through the wilderness yeah. and uh, really death defying some of those soldiers did die along the way because of the bad weather and food shortages and so on and so forth. How does it expa uh, explain his attempt to take uh, Quebec City on the last day of 1775 in a driving snowstorm in which he is seriously mm -hmm. wounded? Yeah. How does it explain his very effective actions in the retreat out of Canada by this mm -hmm. Northern Army? It doesn't explain these things. How does it explain the unbelievable battle at Valcour Island? No. Uh, the yeah. 11th in 1776. Fighting, mm -hmm. defending. And, and that's one of Arnold's talents. It's, he's right. amazing. He's a guy with fundamentally no military experience, despite the various tale, tales that he was taking yeah. about any money. And that's, that stuff is nonsense. It doesn't really fit the real record. Mm -hmm. And and then. He, he does this, and again, he's risking his life. And finally, explain Saratoga to me if there's a yeah, character yeah. law. Right. I know there are a lot of Gates folks out there, and I've met them mm -hmm. along the way, and they try to convince me that Gates was really the hero, but there are a lot of politics behind that at the time. Yeah. When you, when you get into the, the nitty-gritty of those two battles, Arnold is the key, and he did not leave the bat battlefield unwounded. In fact, very, mm -hmm. very they wounded a second time in the cause. So again, explain all the character flaws to me about that story. In fact, yeah. you can't. And that, that's mm -hmm. one of the points that I try to get around to. So how mm -hmm. do you explain this? And okay. it is dealing with arbitrary power. And if you deal with arbitrary power, you can it you can turn that in other directions. I mean, if mm -hmm. if England is the arbitrary power in 1775 for Arnold and increasingly becomes the Continental Congress. It increasingly becomes states, or I guess we can call them states after 1776, certainly. Uh, and, it, and it deals with, uh, you're not supporting the army. You're not supporting the cause. You're not supporting this. You're not supporting that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you do come out. The militia comes out, but usually they don't come out early. They come out late, uh, that sort of thing. And, uh, um, and so he slowly distance himself from the cause. And mm -hmm. I'll just give one example. Here's this guy floating around in Lake Champlain in August and September of 1776, and he gets a letter from Congress because guys who don't like Arnold, they're complaining about him to Congress, and the letter says, your best friends aren't your countrymen. What would you do in that kind of a situation? And what I can tell you was it will affect him over time. It will affect mm -hmm. him over uh, and will begin to turn him in the direction. And I found this uh, one letter, uh, which I think tells a lot, and that is Arnold is angry about his rate of promotion, as he should have been. He's the number one guy. Washington says he's the best I've got, and Congress is piddling around uh, with his promotion. And it's a, it's a long, involved story. And Washington, finally, after Saratoga, Arnold will even, he's already regained his status as a major general. That's been settled before, but he regains his status as uh, a senior major general. So he's promoted back over the guys that were promoted over him. Very sensitive in an age of honor. Mm -hmm. And he's burned up about this. And Congress doesn't have, excuse me if I use the wrong word here, the guts to write him and say, thank you, sir, for what you did for us. Rather, they say, George, you can write him a letter and let him know that his uh, seniority has been restored. So Washington only sends him his letter. He sends him a pair of epaulets, mm. uh, so shoulder military decorations. Mm. Uh, we love you. Thank you for everything you've done. Your, uh, your honor has been uh, restored mm. now, uh, along with uh, your, senior, your, your seniority. Arnold doesn't respond immediately. And remember, he's in a military hospital in Albany, suffering mm. with a severely damaged, right. damaged leg, living in pain. Uh, the misery of all of that. And obviously he's gotten increasingly bitter about what is this? And 
Washington, in many ways, is a mentor to him in saying, we're going to work it all out for you. Uh, you are going to be respected. But Arnold doesn't, he's, at this point, he's got this feeling of that, you know, it goes back to the one letter I described, your best friends aren't your countrymen, which is virtually mm. quote. Well, yeah. goes back, uh, and he uh, reminisces through all of these things that have bothered him, and he mm. then writes a letter to Washington, more or less thanking him. But it took him two or three weeks before he could even compose the letter, and I think that was just, I'm so angry I can't write. Mm. And what he does then, uh, he will uh, say that I want to wish you very well with your cause. I want to wish you very well with your country. And I believe by using the your instead of our, just simple language like that, mm -hmm. he sort of is saying, I'm having a lot of second thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that's oh, so this is after Saratoga, he's having these. Yes, and this this yeah. is probably, i give you a rough point, that letter would have been in late January or February of 1778. Now, amazingly enough, he will then go, uh, even though he's still racked with pain and everything, he will then find a way to Philadelphia, that is uh, uh, to Valley Forge. And he, at that point, in May of 1778, will sign a loyalty oath given to him by uh, uh, what's his name? I've forgotten, I've forgotten his name for a minute there, but uh, um, anyway, um, it's Henry Knox. Okay, General Henry Knox. Knox. administers and Arnold signs it and everything like that. I'm a good little guy, but mm -hmm. really, he then gets in this pickle just to kind of wrap this up, if we could call it a pickle. Uh, and that is Washington says, Well, you, we, we know you can't even really ride a horse comfortably, you can hardly walk. You limp around with a cane and a crutch, all that sort of thing. I'll give you a job to become, you know, the military governor right. of Philadelphia upon the British evacuation mm -hmm. uh, in June of 1778, and it is a disaster. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. All right. sorts of problems. He starts getting in arguments with the local Philadelphia patriots or enthusiasts, and he's no longer that kind of enthusiast. They start mm -hmm. accusing him of all sorts of things, the bulk of which are probably not even true, for that matter. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, maybe someday I should write up that story in detail. But right. I'm not in there yet. That, that would be. Because, again, kind of, there are different <laughs> stories about what leads him to this. And one is that he, he marries again. And That's right. To Peggy Shelton. Like, yeah. And she has expen more expensive tastes. I mean, this is one story we've heard. It may be on the floor with robbing bird's nests. That's right. Is that? Absolutely <laughs> yeah. I always laugh about the bird's nest. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so silly. That somebody would say, well, never mind. I'm not going to talk about bird nest. Okay. His relationship with Peggy is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. His first wife passed away, actually, when he was just leaving Fort Ticonderoga in, back in 1775, wow. where he'd been relieved of command for various political reasons, and who's mm -hmm. going to pay for this, and all that kind of uh, mm -hmm. stuff, that, kind of normal. And uh, he finds out that his first wife, who is also named Peggy, Margaret Mansfield, has died unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So he's not married. I mean, he's he's, yeah. a, he's a widow and he's got three sons. His sister yeah. will help raise the three sons and all that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, and he, after Saratoga, he decides, well, I really would like to find a nice woman to uh, maybe spend my life with, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. perfectly normal activity, and uh, like to be married. Uh, one such relationship doesn't work out. And then uh, uh, he uh, will be in contact and we'll, we'll meet uh, Peggy Shippen. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a teenager, 16, 17 yeah. years old at this point. I can't remember the exact age, but it's, that's about right. And they actually, for whatever reason, fall in love. And um, this causes all sorts of problems for him because the Shippens are known as good loyalists. Right. I think more neutralists. But... Then he's marrying a loyalist. Well, that makes him suspicious. He's also been cracking down on the Philadelphia uh, leaders like uh, uh, Joseph Reed, for example, who is mm -hmm. at that point, I think he is the president of Pennsylvania, uh, a strange office with not a lot of power, but he still holds the office. And they're going after the Tories, and they're like a lynch crowd, if we can call them that. And uh, uh, anyway, the, the, the point is Arnold just gets into all these difficulties with these people. And he just says, I'm, why do I put up with this? 
Yeah. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. You know, arbitrary power has become Joseph Reed. Arbitrary power has become the Continental Congress. Arbitrary power has become people that are after him all the time for various mm -hmm. reasons. I won't, you know, I mean, even Horatio Gates is sees Arnold as a rival and, mm -hmm. and part of the bad mouthing behind his back. And this leads to all sorts of difficulties. And so it just becomes this kind of nasty squabbling scene. And the amazing thing is this is going on among the revolutionaries that I was taught when I was a kid were united and bonded fully and never looked back and stood arm in arm through eight long years. Sometimes when you really look at it and you get into the nitty gritty, after you go to the archives, what you find out uh, was there was a there was something going on, and it's almost miraculous that the American oh, yeah. Revolution, despite all the quibbling among themselves. But Arnold, Arnold decides that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. And he then engages, and of course, the three traditional explanations for Arnold's uh, exit to the other side uh, for his treason. Uh, number one would be Peggy Shippen, because she has some contacts, and they go to uh, Major John Andre, with whom she was not he was much more interested in another ship and woman. So that that's mm -hmm. sort of needs a little of explaining, but not germane right now. Mm -hmm. And the the second source, uh, would of course, would be what? Money, 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 money. He's right, money. Yeah. You know, one guy, uh, a fourth rate uh, revolutionary, uh, uh, he accused Arnold of only being interested in money mm -hmm. at one point and kibitzing about him before Congress, as a matter right. of fact. And then and then the third reason, of course, is the devil. Now, the devil doesn't play that much of a role in the way we interpret history today. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should be. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should. <laughs> maybe we should reconsider some of the yeah. issues. But, but uh, uh, those are the traditional explanations. And they sort of ganged up on Arnold and said, wait a minute, this is a man, very mature, very sophisticated, a brilliant military thinker. Mm -hmm. I could tell you a story about that. I wrote an article commissioned article for a journal I won't mention. And uh, uh, I titled it Benedict Arnold, Military Genius. Mm -hmm. and this this argument is based on, and I related it to the, the great Chinese, perhaps mythical thinker, Sun Tzu or Sun Wu is mm -hmm. called. And one of the things that Arnold understood is, was attack the enemy strategy. And when you look at his military career, he's that's what he's doing in the Northern mm -hmm. Theater. He keeps attacking cutting the British right. off, really uh, successfully severing New England mm -hmm. from the colonies. And so I and I had some other examples where this was true in the way he conducted his uh, con uh, combat operations uh, relating to it. And I said, uh, you know, he knew how to uh, basically a, another point that would come out of Sun Tzu was uh, he knew how to avoid the fight until you're ready to fight when you're mm -hmm. in your force and issues like that. About a week before, two weeks before this journal was supposed to be published, they sent me a final copy, which they hadn't sent me before. Mm -hmm. Guess what had been eliminated? All of that. Wow. Like a poor man's Wikipedia essay. Uh -huh. So we had a little wow. bit of a difficulty there because I said, if you publish it, we're going to have problems because this is not what I sent you. Well, we have to publish it. I said, well, I'm going to explore some avenues. And I did mm -hmm. actually. Uh, was able to publish the, the article, and it's, it's actually now appeared in the uh, book uh, mm. with the uh, Journal of the American Revolution. Um, mm. It's, a, from my point of view, yeah. interesting and successful publication, totally online. It's and, yeah. and uh, so it appeared there. So I said, go ahead and publish it. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got the outlet I wanted, and right. then of course, what happened? This is I, this has happened more more than once to me. A couple of folks wrote in and said about my arguing that Arnold was a military genius. That is the stupidest thing I ever read. That is so dishonest. This guy's just an evil person, you know, going back to wow. that evil thing. And I'm wow. sort of, I'm sort of I've learned, you know, well, you just yeah. let go. You know, I don't have to I shouldn't say this, I don't yeah. have to slap my friend at the Oscars because of that. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, you know, you just live with it. Right. And yeah. So, yeah. And so forth. Yeah. Uh, Right. So anyway, that's that's, yeah, the, that's what in the, in, the, in the story, and that's Thanks. what we're so trying to capture, capture in the in the uh, the, the documentary.
Yeah, yeah. Great. So we're talking with James Kirby Martin, the author of Benedict Arnold, Revolutionary Hero. And also now you've been involved in producing the film. Can you tell us a bit about this process and yes, where we can see it? Happy to. Uh, there you see some pictures. Yeah, and Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed is the yes. title of the film. And that is uh, a title which is designed on purpose to emphasize a couple of things. Number one, we're not looking at Arnold's life backward through treason. That is a false way from my point of view to really do history. We don't live our lives backwards, we live them forward. Mm -hmm. So we tell the story more or less from Arnold's youth forward to and beyond uh, the incident of treason in 1780. So that's, that's one important feature. Um, it is based largely on my, uh, my Arnold book, I was approached by these young filmmakers, um, all, all of whom grew up in up, upstate New York in the Albany, Schenectady mm -hmm. area, and knew lots of stories about Arnold that were floating around and were interested in him. And they said they wanted to uh, get a production company going, uh, mm -hmm. but I was willing to help them. Uh, and so I gave them rights to the book and said, sure, and can I be involved in other ways? And actually, I ended up being executive producer because I spent a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But this was a film 20 years in the making mm -hmm. the best way to describe it and the easiest way for me to explain that is we do a lot of the shooting action setting everything up that you have to do uh get all these scenes and you're seeing some of them uh a lot of reenactors here are involved in this uh uh peter O'Meara's our lead uh very effective i think it's benedict arnold and anyway we just did it when there was money mm -hmm. and let me let me let me give you this. When I, back in the 1980s, I remember General Motors presents George Washington. Right. And that yeah. was Barry Bostwick, as a matter of fact. Yeah. It wasn't that bad of a George Washington. Yeah. This was what 30 some years ago. Yeah. Can you imagine seeing Ford Motor Company present no. Benedict Arnold? Yeah. <laughs> could, so the problem was coming up with enough money to keep this thing going. So. Right. I, back and forth, back and forth, back mm -hmm. and forth. Well, I ended up being a talking head in various ways. And um, you're also, you also play Moses Hazen. So you're yes, a producer, I also play actor, Moses actor Hazen. and talking Just head. I'm not always pro Arnold, you know, I get the right there in that scene. I think that's the one, I can't quite see it, I guess. I'm on the right there. And, yeah. and uh, of course my, my standing joke in that was the Emmy buzz was unbelievable after this scene was shot. <laughs> 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 Kidding completely there, uh, but so we just did it piecemeal and I, I really I'm proud of those guys because three of them and they stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it. Mm -hmm. And the times were feast and fallow, if I could describe yeah, it that yeah. way. Someone said to me recently who saw it and said, What did they do to you? Mm -hmm. And I said, Well, I don't know what you mean. They said, They use some incredible makeup to make you look so much younger. Well, <laughs> I laughed at that and I said, That's <laughs> fine. Excuse me. The last time I appeared before camera was 2007. And wow. there is a bit of a difference between the way I look today. What is that? Yeah. Almost 15 years later. 15 years, yeah. <laughs> like, wait a minute. Uh, I thought that when I saw it. I start using commission formula or something yeah. like that. <laughs> no, that's, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going okay. to. I have to accept what I am. Wow. And just keep that's... going. About... But anyway. So this is this was a project of really of love on the part of mm -hmm. the part of these gentlemen, and I tried to help out when I could, um, and uh, I think we did a really fair-minded job of presenting the mm -hmm. real Benedict Arnold, ultimately raising the question: Did the country betray Arnold before Arnold betrayed the country? Mm -hmm. And that's that's why we say you know the, the the hero betrayed. We didn't put a question mark there, mm -hmm. but we're sort of saying you know there's more than one way to look at something, and when mm -hmm. you look at it from one angle backward through time, you may get back to the baby bird explanation, mm -hmm. but if you look at it forward through time, you may find that there were lots and lots of people that didn't treat Arnold fairly. Uh, that he did really have this issue about arbitrary power. And then mm -hmm. in his mind, in the end, that was part of the reason. Because one of the letters he sent to Major Andre, he said, this country is allowing our army to starve in this land of uh, 
you know, of, of it doesn't yeah. use the word riches, but land of success. Mm -hmm. And you can see that. He'd get mad at Congress because they wouldn't support the, quote me, widow, even though they, I guess, technically weren't married, widow and the children of uh, Joseph Warren, and right. he in some money. That's another thing about Arnold. Arnold invested in the cause. And yeah. so in his mind, if I got something back from the British, I'm simply getting back what I put into this cause, which turned out in his mm -hmm. mind to be a lost cause. Right. And that's, of course, why some of his detractors would say it was about money. But again, he... Uh, one of the things I wonder about is he's an apothecary. He has a business going to the West Indies. You mentioned he, he becomes a military genius. How does that come about? Because there are other guys like Gates, for example, or Charles Lee, who have military training, who aren't really? military geniuses. Yes. In so fact, they do have military training, a lot of it, which Arnold did not have. But Arnold did have a certain kind of training because he would captain Ultimately, in moving beyond his career as an apothecary, fairly soon he gets involved in uh, uh, sort of international trade. He trades up into Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, he's patenting these ships. He trades down uh, merchant merchant uh, craft. He trades down into the West Indies. There's lots of information that survived about that. And part of being a captain of a ship is a military experience because you're working with a crew that is operating under orders, operating under discipline as it must uh, sometimes they're operating too severely under discipline. That's a, that's another issue. But that's one way he gained military experience. And it's another way that he gained military not knowledge. He wasn't limited to just understanding what the coast of uh, Connecticut was all about or uh, Long Island across the, across the bay there or that sort of thing. And that's a very, very important point. And so he did have this mind that would allow him to en envision much more broadly Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a letter to Congress in 75, and he said, we got to take Canada. And I'm the, he actually says, I'm the man to do it. Mm -hmm. because yeah. He does have self-confidence. He's no longer the coward that he was right. when, he, yeah. he up when he was a kid. So that's yeah. part of it. And that then made it possible for him not only to fight on land, but this is very rare. He becomes the admiral of the fleet on Lake Champlain. Yes. He's the naval commander. Yeah. Not just on land, but on sea. That yeah. versatility is rare indeed. I can't give you two other examples that come to no. mind. If I thought about it, I could. But that's another thing that is so exceptional about him that is part of this fascinating story about this man who has been cast aside but really is worth looking at and studying. Mm -hmm. It's a tr In many ways, it is both what I would call uh, a story of heroism, but it's also a human tragedy. Uh, it is. And that's the way we would look at it today. Uh, mm -hmm. and that is uh, what perhaps we're trying to do is to get people to say, well, let's look at the real nuts and bolts of history. Mm -hmm. Ironically, through the person we're not expecting to study, and that is Benedict Arnold. Right, right. Now, as you've said, there's more than one way of looking at things. And you're, you actually began your career, if I can think of it this way, looking at history from the bottom up. That is the ordinary, that's right. impulse, the ordinary. So it's kind of interesting that now we're talking about one great figure. Right. But again, one of your other really terrific books is about Joseph Plum Martin, someone who I would never have heard about if it had not been for you and your book, Ordinary Courage, because here is an ordinary guy who is right. in the Continental Army. So he's one of the forgotten folks who is one of these uh, neglected soldiers that Arnold is talking about. So how did you get onto the Joseph Plum Martin story and what does his story tell us? And, and also, is, is he a relative? Oh, well, let me answer the last question first. From all the evidence that I have, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> but, but what I did, which I never thought about, I dedicated the volume to my wonderful one or now deceased aunt and uncle. Both of them lived, lived past 100 years. Wow. Uh, and, and uh, uh, and I just thought I made a line, put a line in something like they, because we, we had great conversations. Mm -hmm. They're really second parents to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and obviously much older and that sort of thing. And I thought, well, they, they'd have a great conversation with Joseph Plum Martin. Just, mm -hmm. And I am apparently implied that there may be some relative connection, uh, okay. there, which I didn't, I didn't mean to do, but I get asked a lot. And then I have to say, well, uh, not really so far as so my folks, uh, my forebears, actually, and I've got the bit beyond way back to the revolution and beyond mostly came through Pennsylvania, as a matter of fact. And uh, um, 
you know, the English in their background, a lot of Quakers in their background, that sort of thing. So um, anyway, the the what happened was I ran across, and it was a, it's amazing what happens when you visit bookstores. And I was at a bookstore, one of these historic sites back, back, back east. This was probably in the 1970s, I'm guessing, because uh, I taught at Rutgers for a number of years before moving to Texas. And uh, anyway, I ran across this little volume called Private Yankee Doodle. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm trying to remember the guy who edited the volume, his name, because I haven't looked at it for years. And I said, this is, this is a fascinating story about an ordinary human being. And he's talking about his experiences, what I, mm -hmm. not from on high, not what the Washingtons or whatever. He said, you know, it's kind of a line in there like, well, Alexander the Great was great, but he was only great because he had all these soldiers mm -hmm. who were dying for him. And so I want to tell the story from the point of view of the common person. Right. This is unbelievable because mm -hmm. that was sort of beginning to trend in the field historiographically. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I assigned it to students. That is the private Yankee Doodle mm -hmm. volume. Um, and George Shear was the, the name of the editor, if I'm recalling this correctly. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the students liked it, but they said, uh, you know, what do they always say? It's too long. Uh, the Tithi repeats things over and over and how many bad food stories do you need to read and all that sort of thing. And so I took it as a personal assignment. I would slightly shorten it. And I sort of mm -hmm. said I, I became Martin's editor that he needed because at mm -hmm. the time the book was very unpopular because it seemed so unpatriotic. Yeah. You know, I gave my all and what was my reward? And then he basically said we were turned we were turned loose like old worn out horses in the pasture. Mm -hmm. We didn't yeah. do anything for us. And he then relates that to the coming pension system that comes in and uh, mm -hmm. what is it roughly speaking in 18, 18, 18, 19, yeah. something yeah. like that. Uh, and that's, he addresses that in the, in the last chapter. But the point is to convince students they needed to read it. I had to figure out a way to shorten it a little bit mm -hmm. and it worked. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, yeah. Let me cut through everything at work. Right. Uh, yeah. It's sold lots and lots and lots of copies. It's been used in, um, mm -hmm. Uh, courses, you know, revolution type courses, all that sort of thing. Yes. It's a pretty successful book. It has been, yeah. So I think um, we're talking with James Kirby Martin. Just, uh, you know, I would love to have you on again to talk more about a respectable army and about uh, Joseph available. Martin. But you've also just written a novel about World War II yes. surviving Dresden. And I think my real question is why didn't you write a novel about the revolution? Ah, but we are. <laughs> that's, a really that's a great setup. Uh, I uh, have been always been very interested in getting the richness of history out to the, the people, to mm -hmm. get it beyond, not just in the academy. Where we had a lot of good discussions and everything. We tend to talk among ourselves. Get it out yes. there more broadly. Um, and as a net result, I uh, was working on a. a History Channel program with a writer. This is years ago. Uh, and he said, well, he wanted to do something on Benedict Arnold. That, that project never, unfortunately, never went anywhere. Uh, and then I said, well, I've been doing work uh, with the United Indians. In fact, I was in the Syracuse area last mm -hmm. week in a program uh, with Ray Hall Britter, who's the uh, chief head of the United Nation. And, and anyway, uh, it, it was just this kind of a kind of a situation uh, where I kept saying there's got to be a way to broaden this out. Mm -hmm. What I did, I made contact with a man, now a very good friend of mine, working partner by the name of Bob Burris. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob and I started out with a script about uh, the Oneida Indians and warfare in the Mohawk Valley. Mm -hmm. We almost made it into a movie. Then the project fell apart. Those things happened. So. Bob and I said, well, we're going to continue, and we're going to continue. So we, then we did uh, a, a script based on the Newburgh conspiracy. Had some reading success, but nobody's putting any chunk on the, you know, change, change under my chunk. I mean, sorry, chunking any change on the table. I'm sort of trying to yeah. think about right. Uh, and then uh, based on a trip I had to Germany in which uh, 
of visiting Dresden, the city that was bombed to oblivion in 1945. It so, it so happened that our local tour guide was a former, uh, I guess, Soviet who lived in Dresden uh, and now is a tour guide. And she denounced the Allies for bombing this city. And I'm, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I just, mm -hmm. my wife's saying, yeah. don't say anything, just live with it. But I then began this sort of side project. I read mm -hmm. everything I could find about Dresden. And, and then I read, uh, these very a lot of there's a lot of them out there, uh, which are sort of memoirs of their experiences, mm -hmm. and then Bob and I sort of work that into the Dresden story that looks at mm -hmm. what happened there with this terrible bombing situation. Was it justified? What, another question: mm -hmm. When do you stop the killing? When the killing won't stop? Which, by the way, is very related to the Ukraine right now. Oh yes, yes. Uh, I've I've done a, did a program recently comparing World War II and what's going on in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So I get into the 20th century because I've always had this interest. My father fought uh, in the North Africa and France during World War II and all that sort of thing. And so uh, that's really got us got us going. Now, the point of all of that blabbing on my part uh, is uh, that Bob and I now have gone back and we are going to work, we're actually actively working on what would be a second novel for us where we are going to write the Oneida story. Oh, wow. And uh, we, we, we begin it with a visit by Lafayette in 1824-25 in that area, go backward through time. Uh, and so it's built around the themes that are in the, uh, what I, the book that I offer with jo, jo, Joseph Plantar, um, uh that is the Oneida Indians uh, Forgotten Allies. Forgotten Allies. Yes. Right. And, and so what, what, Bob and I are doing is we're writing it right now. I got it right over there. I just when am I going to work on this? <laughs> if I could, if I could put it there. Maybe when we stop talking, you can get back yeah. to it. So, so anyway, so oh. that's what happened. So yes, we are, and then of course we will through the various contacts that Bob has because he's out there. He's a professional in in the Hollywood mm -hmm. setting, uh, and some that I've been able to develop. We're going to try it again uh, to develop uh, a, a movie project out of this. And we've had some interest, by the way, in surviving mm -hmm. Dresden. We haven't gotten the big bite yet, but mm -hmm. you never can tell about these kinds of things. It's a gamble, but the idea with this gambling is to spread the wealth of history out there in a thoughtful, intelligent way, because we know so much of what is produced. Well, should I mention the film, The Patriot? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Anyway, so that's what's going on. Well, that's great. That's that's great because actually one of our current recurring um, questions is why hasn't there been a really good movie made about the revolution where there have been lots of good movies about World War Two, right? And so maybe you're on you're on the path. Maybe. Well, and uh, that project is uh, is I would describe it the the, the movie script itself uh, is there, mm -hmm. uh, and the times are sort of maybe now moving in our direction. Uh, that we'll be able to uh, uh, get this project started again. Yeah, yeah. Good. So we'll, it's like anything. We keep poking around. You know, sometimes you just find the right door to go through, but sometimes you have to poke at twenty-five before you find the right one. Right. That, that, that's a good way to look at it. I always thought Molly Brandt would be a good figure for a novel. Absolutely, and she will be on the edge of this story, by the okay. way, because of Joseph. Because right, the main, the main. Uh, character is a Hanyeri Dockstater. I would give you his Indian name, but frankly, I cannot pronounce it. Uh, and he is a great warrior of the United Nation. And he and Joseph Brandt, uh, Tandangir, however I'm supposed to say it, um, are not good friends. And so you have that you have that protagonist antagonist situation that runs through the story. And I think it would make a great film. But then again, you got to find the person with uh, Mula. The Things happen. Right, right. Well, good luck. Well, thank you for joining us. We've been talking with James Kirby Martin, the um, the Cullen Professor of History Emeritus at, uh, yeah. from the University of Houston, still in Houston, and still working at poking around with history. So thank you so much for joining us. It was very much my pleasure. And uh, just remember this, there are lots of good stories out there. And there are. Let's keep enjoying them and learning from them. And I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, and I think it would be unfair to mention that he was in The Patriot as an extra. 
Uh, he is the man behind the curtain who does all the heavy lifting. And I want to thank our many, many listeners. In fact, you know, Jim, when we started doing the podcast, we thought we'd be talking to a handful of folks, but we have a pretty steady audience around the world. So in the past week, we had listeners in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Lebanon, Indiana, and in Nazareth, Nazareth itself. So we have a global audience and I thank them all for joining us and I look forward to um, hearing more from you and um, if people have ideas about topics they'd like to discuss send me an email or allison at suffolk.edu and thank you all and now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. Thank you.